We're here with UKIP leader Nigel Farage. Um, moments after he's announced the UKIP uh, no to, Say No to EU tour, um, Nigel, welcome to Breitbart London's embassy. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for coming here. Um, you, you gave a, a good long speech this morning about this tour that you're, um, you're launching across the United Kingdom um, to reach out sort of beyond the Westminster bubble, I think was, was the words you were yeah. using. 300 dates. That's, that's a lot of dates. Yeah, not all for me. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I mean, you give. One of the great myths is that you think it's a one man band. It isn't. I'm the leader of it. I'm the governor, fine. Um, but we've got a lot of very good people involved in UKIP. You know, as MEPs, we've got Mr. Carswell as an, as an MP, hundreds of councillors all over the country. And one of the things that we've done is to bring back the public meeting. You know, the old-fashioned public meeting, the hustings, turn up, listen, agree, disagree, behave within reason. Um, I've done over a 1,000 meetings for UKIP. And now, in the last fortnight, Suddenly, Jeremy Corbyn's done half a dozen. <laughs> it's all brand new. No, to hell with it. I've been doing it for 20 years. Well, I, was, oh. I was struck when George Galloway launched his mayoral campaign in London. It was almost exactly the same as one of your meetings. Yeah, that's right. I, I think there is a genuine hunger amongst real people. Um, you know, I'd put a cord on Santa's hair around Westminster. There are, there are many real people here. Um, real people want to turn up to meetings, listen, question, meet, shake hands, agree, disagree, um, and I think I've become really a bit of a transessor in this action. Were you um, were you at all affected by David Cameron's announcement that he's changing the wording of the referendum question, so it's no longer a say no, it's a it's a stay in or leave? Has that? Well, great. I mean, look, the electoral commission. Um, who have failed utterly in everything they've done since 2001, for the first time, have done the right thing. And why? Because a thousand UKIP members wrote to them. And that's written in their submission. A thousand UKIP members wrote to say that, you, well, two things really. Firstly, that the question only gave one option. And secondly, that the SV no positive and negative thing um, worked against um, the, the come out side. And you see, actually, think about it. I've been saying that for some months, that the Yes campaign are busy. Every single day we get some ghastly person like Tony Blair or Lord Mandelson or <laughs> you know, Richard Branson saying we must, must vote to stay in the European Union. Um, it's really important. And, uh, oh, and by the way, we should join the Euro too. Um, I'm a no campaign. We're doing nothing because they're waiting. Because they're Tories. They're waiting to see the extent of the Prime Minister's renegotiation. So I've been pushing now for some time to say, look, there's no point waiting. He's not renegotiating anything fundamental at all. Let's get cracking. So, so no, I, you know, I think we're in the right place. Your impact on um, the referendum campaign um, is one that is, has led to some, well, a lot of debate in Westminster. Um, not least this morning, which seemed to me a conveniently timed uh, sort of double-headed uh, uh, attack in The Telegraph and The Spectator of a poll that the field work yeah, for the poll yeah, took yeah. place in early May. I mean, how do you respond to things like that? Well, or do you just the, not? Well, look, the posh boys, you know, um, who've never had a job, come straight from Oxbridge and into politics, um, who are generally too cowardly to take on the really big issues of the day, and um, think they should be the top dogs in this referendum campaign. Well, I'm very happy to work with them, but you know, the idea that any of them could lead anything, I mean, I wouldn't let most of them run a bath, frankly. Um, they're not people who are connected or grounded with the real world. Um, so, look, they have a go at me and they produce a poll. Um, their line, of course, is Farage is toxic, you know. Uh, well, at least the public have heard of me. Who's ever heard of any of that? Mm. Mm. That sort of leads us on to the, the, the different campaigns as well. People have heard from a lot of different campaigns. Um, I've just spoken to somebody um, from the Campaign for uh, Independent Britain. Um, there's the For Britain campaign. There's the No, spelled K-N-O-W. Mm. Mm. Um, 
you've spoken about you know the benefits of having a wide range of views and the fact that you will work with anyone. Are there any negatives to having so such a diverse field of no, out campaigns? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, if um, if there is a fisherman's campaign against the EU, that's great. It targets the fisherman. If there's a housewife's campaign against the EU, that targets the housewife. Um, if there's a UKIP campaign against the EU, well, that targets UKIP voters, non-voters, um, Labour voters, who will be appalled when Corbyn <laughs> becomes the leader. Um, well, specifically, which, which Labour vote are you talking about there? Well, there are two Labour votes, you know, as I see it. There is a, a left-wing traditional socialist Labour vote. Um, and make no mistake, I mean, Corbyn will not collapse the Labour vote overnight because he'll get the Green vote. I mean, come on. You know, he rides a bicycle. He's got a bit. Or he, well, you have too. But, <laughs> you know, he rides a bicycle. He's got a bit. And, and, and he's a vegan teetotaler. So, so there's no point voting Green anymore because, you know, <laughs> you've got your man. Um, there are many on the, you know, hard left in this country haven't voted for years. They'll vote for him. Um, but what I do see is a, an old Labour vote, traditional, uh, family orientated, um, immensely, and this may sound funny to Metropolitan viewers, but immensely proud of the contributions their families have made in two world wars. Uh, you know, good, blooming decent people who voted Labour because they've always thought Labour was on their side uh, and they will look at Corbyn as a friend of Jerry Adams. Do you think that also extends to the Labour families, Labour voting families out there whose sons and daughters served in the Falklands, in the Iraq well, War? I mean, look, you know, I, I went to a school in South London where on our war memorial there are the names of 852 old boys killed in two world wars and we were dragged up with this six victoria crosses one george cross i was dragged up with this stuff um and i believe when i was a boy in the 70s that it was very very important by about 1990 that generation after me didn't think it was very important and it was falling into sort of disrepair as an idea that one could believe in i think the sad irony of Afghanistan and Iraq is that now the entire population connects with the concept of service people being killed, maimed, wounded. Um, and I have to say, <laughs> it is an irony for me. Um, I was a strong opponent of the Iraq war. I saw it as Bush's vengeance without any proper reasoning or meaning. Um, if one good thing has come out of it, it is that at least we now have more respect for our military our traditions and what our families have sacrificed that we've had for at least 30 years. In, in terms of public opinion, not necessarily from people out in Westminster. Oh, well, no. Yeah. I mean, Westminster, Westminster and public opinion have diverged for years. Um, I think the growth of UK has proved that. I also think that the growth of Corbyn's proved that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, forget the politics of it. Forget what I agree with him on or disagree with him on. Um, I agree with almost nothing, but but you know, what's he done in this campaign? He's engaged people who weren't members of the Labour Party. He's engaged people who think, hey, this guy actually believes in things. And one of the reasons I loathe EU membership is that it completely stultifies our view on policy, our view on ability of what we can do. One of, one of the founder members of UKIP was a guy called Gerald Roberts. He's dead now. And Gerald was a Wickhamist, socialist, economist, very left-wing, lovely man, very left-wing. And he and I would argue in the pub after UKIP NECs in the early days of the 90s. And we'd argue about policy furiously. In the end, Gerald said, right, I've got a solution. It's twofold. Firstly, we should agree that UKIP believes we have the right to mismanage our own country, and that rather appealed to me. Um, and secondly, there is no point in you and I having a row over a pint if the Westminster Parliament is impotent to deal with the issues. And that's the point. And the reason 
that I've said today that I would welcome Jeremy Corbyn onto a platform with me is this isn't about left or right. It isn't about agreeing or disagreeing. It's about do we have a sovereign country that has the ability to agree and a Supreme Court that is supreme. And that's why this referendum is the most important constitutional question I'm going to face in my lifetime. And that brings us on to one of the issues that um, we seem to have lost control over. Um, and that's the big topic of the day, migration, refugees, asylum seekers. Um, but I don't want to ask you the, the questions you've been asked all morning. Um, I actually want to pick up on some of the very interesting things that you raised um, in your speech earlier today. Um, you, you said that uh, in terms of motivating factors, was it 95 percent of people that are that are coming into or trying <coughs> to into well, what I said was this. Migrants? Hang on. What I said was this: that the traditional definition of refugee, uh, reaffirmed by the 1951 UN Convention on Refugee Status, was that a refugee is an individual who fears persecution because of their race, their class, uh, their political views. Um, and to update it, perhaps sexual orientation as well. Okay. So, so it is an individual believing that because of what he or she is, they will be persecuted for that view. Um, and I think that what the European Union has done, and goodness me, I tried my best in April, nine days before a general election, to go to Strasbourg to to confront and deal with, 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 with Mr. Juncker, the Commission President, um, they've now set the bounds for what qualifies for asylum refugee status so wide that it goes not just beyond personal persecution, it goes to living in war-torn areas. Indeed, as Juncker said, it involves, it, it includes extreme poverty. So what the European Union is saying is of the world's population of six billion, four billion could qualify. It's absolutely crackers. We can't deal with a system like this. And what's worse than the definition is the reality, which is all you have to do is set foot inside a European Union country and you can stay. Now, please, no one looking at this misinterpret me. I am not saying that we should not help people in genuine need. Indeed, my own forebears were French Protestants, Huguenots, you know, who came to Britain. 50,000 of them came over 100 years to Britain. Um, and this country was very welcoming to Jewish people from Russia in the early 20th century, to Jewish people in the 30s and 40s, who came from Germany and Austria, Ugandan Asians in the 70s, who famously became the most successful group of migrants ever to come to Britain in our history. Um, you know, I don't, I mean, you know, I, I don't need lecturing by Chancellor Merkel or anybody about our duties and responsibilities. We get this. What I'm saying is we're not getting the definition of who is a refugee right. And what I said today, it wasn't me. Although I observed, as I drive through Calais every week, they're mostly young men between sort of 15 and 30. Uh, I was quoting Robert Fico, who is the Prime Minister of Slovakia, who said the, the leaders of the European Union are not being honest about who's coming. 95% of those who come are economic migrants. And my worry is this. One photograph can be enormously powerful. And you know, history shows us that. It's funny, isn't it? You know, 71 people die and are discovered rotting in a truck in Austria. And kind of, we all say, oh, okay, fine. One photograph of a young three-year-old boy being taken from the sea in Turkey by a police officer uh, and a very poignant picture. And suddenly that photograph changes our whole approach to migration and what we should be doing. And the cry goes up, something must be done. I've got four kids. Um, you know, I'm not some sort of cold-hearted right-winger. I get it. 
I understand it. I share with everybody um, the horror, uh, the, the abomination that is that picture. But we have to, we have to let our short-term emotional reaction be overcome by a more considered view, which is how do we stop more pictures of the three-year-old kids being dragged dead out of the Mediterranean? Do we do it by a European policy that says that anyone that comes can be accepted? Do we do it by what Chancellor Merkel has done this week? By saying, please, come, anyone, come. You know, we'll take 800,000. Oh, oh, and by the way, I promise you, I'll bully my neighbours into taking even more. I think that misguided EU policy, which I tried to point out in April, and what Merkel has done this week, which has compounded it by a factor of three or four, means that actually, and I'm sorry to say this, but it's true, we will see more photographs of young kids being dragged dead out of the Mediterranean, and more stories about lorries, you know, being filled with, 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 with people who have suffocated, or whatever it is. Every single one of these factors is playing into the hands of the criminal gangs, the traffickers, and dare I say it, even ISIS too. Um, just finally, to wrap up, you mentioned Calais. Mm. Um, we haven't heard that much about Calais in the last few weeks. The, the focus has really been on, <coughs> on the Mediterranean, um, Hungary, Austria, so forth. You've been through Calais um, a countless number of times in the last... Including yesterday. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, what is the situation in Calais now? Because Look, actually the, the media is not telling us. Look, we are opted out of the Schengen Agreement, which is why most people that set foot in Southern Europe head for Germany. Okay? If we were not opted out of Schengen, many of them would, would, would be coming here perfectly legally. Because of Schengen, they camp to Calais. Um, the message to them is very simple from Britain. If you get here illegally and you're found out, your chances of being returned are, are, are less than one in four. Um, I, I mean, the level, even though we're opted out, the level of disruption this summer to Kent and elsewhere has been absolutely enormous. Uh, I go through Calais every week. I was there last night. Um, <coughs> I don't see women and children. I see young men between 15 and 30. I see young men, very few from Syria, by the way, mostly from Somalia, Mali, Nigeria, and elsewhere. They are economic migrants. I don't blame anybody for wanting to make their lives better. We're living in a world of six billion people. There's a limit to what we can cope with. And I think this... Uh, this whole conversation needs some more honest debate. I, I just want to finish by saying this, that you know, I'm the leader of UK. Um, we're a party that has been demonized over migration issues uh, ever since we rose, sort of rose in the polls in early 2013. We have believed from day one that this country has a fine, noble tradition above any other country in Europe in terms of dealing with genuine genuine refugees, uh, but that whole vision has been obscured by us becoming borderless Britain. When I was asked today, how many would you take? I said, well, last year we took 640,000, know, the highest number of people ever to come to Britain in one year. And I'm convinced of one thing. I'm convinced of the reasonableness, the decency of the average British person. And if we win this referendum, if we get back control of our borders, put in place a proper skills-based Australian-style point system that doesn't discriminate against India and Canada in favour of Romania, but just looks at people as people and what they have to bring. Uh, and we get immigration numbers down drastically, which we can do under that system, then we'll have a lot more room and a lot more time to return to our traditional role of being of all the countries of Europe the most welcoming to genuine refugees. Nigel Farage, leader of UKIP, thanks very much. Thank you.